are rolling. So, all right. Great. All right. Thanks, guys, uh, for our second installment of uh, guest speaker series here on the roundtable. We are super, super blessed tonight. We have, uh, I don't know about you guys, but for me, he's mystical, he's iconic, he's controversial, and he is sure a lot of fun to watch on YouTube. Uh, Jesse Noller, welcome to the roundtable. Howdy. Um, um, thank you. You are welcome. We, uh, so this, uh, I had sat on this uh, Discord for a minute with just a few close friends and didn't really know what I wanted to do with it until it finally clicked one day and I said, I want to go deep. I want to be controversial. I want to uncover, you, you, you know, I, I want to get rid of the, the caveman science and I want the real science. And uh, mostly I, the, the round table is all about everybody has a place. Everybody gets to have a voice. We're not going to gatekeep. We're not going to, you know, charge people for information. We're just going to share information. And uh, you you were surely one of the very first people on the list uh, to, to try to get in here. So uh, without further ado, why don't you just give us some background on uh, your how you got started in mycology and uh, where you're at right now? We uh, Give me one moment to... Uh... Organize my thoughts. It's uh, I uh, I have ADHD, and I'll probably mention that later a little bit more. But um, so it's a little bit past my med time, um, <laughs> and so I'm like, all right, there's the thought. Um, so hi everyone, good evening. Um, it, my name's Jesse Noller. I'm the founder and owner of the Humble Fungus. Uh, we are a really a three-person um, mushroom farm in mycology supply just outside of Denver, Colorado. Um, we, uh, I founded the company on basically the idea that I wanted to be a quote-unquote sport table mushroom farm, um, which is to say I wanted to handle start to finish everything, you know, uh, genetics, spores, um, and as I, as I kind of got into everything, I realized that, that extended to, uh, efforts for, um, preserving species, especially endangered ones like the Agaricon, uh, doing a lot of field work, um, looking at, you know, deeper soil science, and then really begin to merge kind of like the world of kind of mycology and modern science and kind of getting in between these different camps and merging everything. So that birth humble. And so we do everything. Uh, we start from, we start everything that we can from spores. Um, some species you just can't, some varieties you just can't. Um, we do, I do uh, a lot of our gene work. Bradford, the mushroom champ, uh does a we're kind of working together now so he's got his own line that we're kind of like pushing together too and so he's been doing a lot of his own gene work you know type hunting you know hunting and so i started the company doing that and uh pretty soon i had uh, actually started it uh in my house at the time that i was renting and um about a 12 foot by 30 foot bedroom which don't even get me started like who makes a bedroom like that but um 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 but uh so i started it and uh in in that room i had a 10 foot by eight foot greenhouse that i was fruiting everything from shiitake to reishi to lion's mane to therapeutic varieties um, and though I'll be very, very open and a lot more transparent than I might be in other venues, um, I still do have to kind of watch. So anyway, um, that actually had my entire lab. Um, I started actually building all by building all my own flow hoods. I built, <laughs> I built quite a few, um, because at first I was like, oh, look, I'm going to go read this paper on laminar flow. And I went and watched everyone's YouTube. And I was like terrified. I was like, okay, so you need to have pounds per square inch fan. Um, 
the first one I built was expensive and to quote unquote specs. Um, and it was not great. And so I decided to build another one. Then I built, sold that one and I built another one. Um, and I very quickly started kind of like falling down this rabbit hole of sort of myth busting where I was like, wait a minute, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Something in the back of my spidey sense is tickling. Oh, that's right. It's called science. Seeing it, it exists. Let's go look at what biology labs do and what their gear looks like. And I went looked and I said, oh, fuck. Um, all right. So then I went and built a very large flow hood. And all I did was I got a uh, nice big um, Novatech filter, you know, 99% EPA filter. Uh, got two of them, built it like very, very, very single. <laughs> got the biggest can fan, so inline fan for like cannabis tents and things like that. Um, got the biggest freaking one you could think of. Dubbed it in the top, put a nice, good pre filter on it, turned it up, and I was like, by the way, it doesn't matter how strong the airflow is, as long as it doesn't blow the sample off the scalp off. So, uh, so yeah, so now fast forward, um, we're in a 5,000 5, square foot warehouse. And like I said, it's me, uh, the mushroom camp, Bradford, um, and um, Chris, who's Papa Ligaba, and I will link him, I'll link both of them on Discord so you can like chat with him and stuff. Um, so, uh, we're now in a great big warehouse. Um, we're looking at possibly, um, in a perfect world, we'd mo be moving to Denver here soon. Um, but that's dependent on a lot of things, namely money. Um, but, um, yeah, so we're in a 5,000 square foot facility. We do everything in house, right? So we use, for example, we outsource things like bags and we're not making our own freaking plates. We're not making cute little things that we can otherwise buy, right? So it's like, I'm not making automatic water machines. I went and bought an automatic watering machine to fill bags of millet, right? Um, and then um, we do fruiting. So fruiting chambers, we do, uh, we build all of our own substrates by hand. So we've got our wood lovers mixes. We've got our uh, manure and uh, vegan. So biosolid and non-biosolid blends for um, therapeutic and other varieties, kind of like secondary decomposer varieties. Um, casing layer, we go through about, um, about a pallet to a pallet and a half of um, Colorado Millet every month, uh, which we, we sell. Uh, because as I was building the company, what I realized is that there was a real uh, lack of products that had actually been used. Right? It's um, what I mean by that. And I'm not going to name names. That is not my jam. I don't name names. I don't call people out. I don't like drama. <laughs> I don't have time for it. Um, and though I can be a very controversial guy, it's fundamentally, it's just understand my only goal in life is to get more people to understand and appreciate fungi and just how fucking amazing they are. Um, so, um, so we do fruiting, we make our own millet, we make our own substrates by hand, um, and we do it um, by weight, right? We measure everything out. We double check, you know, soil chemistry, we double check acidity. We do all these things, right? So, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, we track a lot of data, right? So we track, you know, bioefficiency, which is a common calculation in the cultivation industry, uh, mushroom farming industry too, of kind of like what you're getting, you know, what kind of like return on investment you're getting from a given substrate and kind of like spawn mix. Um, biological efficiency is calculated by the wet of the, uh, the weight of the wet harvest um, multiply, uh, multiplied or divided by. Yeah, no, I'm forgetting. Anyways, look at bioefficiency calculation. I just brain cramped on it. Anyways, it's like, Rate of the harvest, um, I think either minus or divided to whatever I'm forgetting. Um, and by the weight of the dry substrate, right? So not the wet substrate, right? Because in, we can talk plenty about why fungi love water and 
where reduction and where it becomes kind of like a bottleneck later. But yeah, you don't count water. It doesn't count. Um, actually, I can't resist saying something about it. The reason why wa water doesn't count in your total weight when you're calculating bioefficiency is because the actual mycelium, like the fruit bodies you're getting, are mycelium. Mycelium is chitin. Chitin is pure, like it's basically it's carbon manipulated by the fungi to turn it into this like ultra strong cell wall, right? It's just like that's why they can push the concrete. They can um, pierce the cell walls of like really incalcitrant minerals and things, or not cell walls. The gaps, the air gaps between, and then ultimately use their exoenzymes to dissolve things like minerals and other good things. Um, so, anyways, that's why you don't use water because the dry substrate is carbon, right? That is the matter that it is both burning in terms of like nitrogen and carbon to create that mass. So when you dry it, obviously you get like, I think it's on average, it's like 10 to 20% dry weight off of a wet mushroom harvest, right? Um, that is technically, you know, a one-to-one -one comparison to what your dry substrate is, right? So because you're looking at the ultimate yield of the wet harvest as a cultivator and as a farmer and somebody going to markets and restaurants, et cetera, you can have the wet weight. Um, we track a lot of data, as I said, um, and we follow a lot of plants. And what I mean by that is testing. We do a lot of control testing, so blind and blind controls. And basically what I try to do is I say, okay, how could I have possibly biased this? How could we take ourselves out of the situation? How do we remove variables to a certain extent? Um, and so what we end up doing is we do a lot of substrate trials. We test things like Dr. Mike's MGT blends. Um, we're working with uh, species that, you know, are supposedly uncultivatable, but, you know, it's actually a matter of, you know, chemistry. So, uh, well, chemistry and some other stuff. Um, so yeah, it's we do the humble fungus. It's like we do everything. We have liquid cultures. We don't do spores. Spores are kind of like a red flag word uh, to all the people we don't necessarily want to be talking to. Um, so we kind of just go around that. Um, uh, substrates. Uh, we're working on bringing back all of our fruiting kits for culinary. It's just. Um, we haven't been able to, like, we're making millet every day. Whenever somebody uh, orders something, if we don't have it in stock that same day, uh, we go and we make it by hand, right? And so very frequently it's like we're selling millet that we could have otherwise used to make fruiting kits, but going out to you people because we love it too. And I wish I could hold more, but not really. Right, good problem. To have. But um, fruiting kits. Uh, we do a lot of genotype hunting in the lab. We do pre pour auger. We do all the things, right? Like I said, we handle everything in house. Um, and yeah, um, it's kind of an exciting time for us. It's been really a tough few years. I started it right before COVID, and I'll go into as to why in a moment, but um, it's been rough, right? And I know it's been rough for all of us. It's been. It has been something fucking else. Right, if I'm being honest, it's like I kind of look back at the last couple of years and I'm like, yeah, so that definitely happened. Cool. Right, it's like when, it, when you're, when you're going to kind of like, when are the feelings all going to catch up where you're like, ah, whoa. Um, so it's been a rough few years. I started the company originally with the ideal of getting fresh culinary mushrooms to farmer's markets as quickly as possible, start growing massive amounts of, uh, in fact, okay, my first grow, my first mushroom grow, right? At the time I was trying, I had just moved to Colorado and I decided I was going to start a company uh, growing weed, like every single person who moves to Colorado does, right? Um, I discovered this much too late. Anyway, <laughs> um, so uh, I was growing uh, cannabis and I was also growing vegetables, right? So 
it was kind of like this conjunction of things where I was working in tech and then um, I was also growing weed, but I was also volunteering at a food bank. Um, and they had this um, vegetable program each spring where um, to anybody who came to the food bank, they'd just uh, give away free seed plants, free seeds, you know, instructional things. I'm like, hey, shoot, can I hold a workshop? Right. Um, I immediately did the natural thing that I do is I uh, grossly overdid it. <laughs> and uh, because I was working in tech at the time, I had a nice spoiled tech baby salary. So um, I basically gave them, I don't know, like 30, 40 pounds of seeds. Um, but uh, COVID had hit by then. And pretty much the wheels came off the world. And I started going more and more into mycology supply. I shipped fresh mushrooms all over the U.S. at first. And then I realized how terrible shippers are. Um, I'm sorry if you've gotten a package from us that's been ruined um, or contaminated. Like, we've had to take protective measures. Like, one of the key things when I say we follow the science is if we fuck up, if we make a mistake, right, we go and we try to figure out what went wrong. We try to learn from it and fix things, right? So, for example, shipping sterilized grain. Hardboard. Hardboard collects mold and contamination like it's going out of effing style. Temperature variances and shitty air all over the place, gaps in cardboard, shipping boxes, et cetera, um, we'll very happily eventually go through any type of filter, air filter pads that you have on any type, any type of bag, right? Um, because filter patches, by their very design, let gas exchange occur. By its very nature, gas exchange and just mo molecules in general, you know, lots of molds, lots of contaminants will go sub 0.2 microns, right? Um, mushroom farming is one of those things where we're trying to minimize risk, but there is always risk, right? So we kind of learned the hard way that when you're shipping grains to customers and things like that, you, not only do you have to put them in a nice box, you have to put padding because God help us. Like, how do you take a three pound bag of millet and vaporize it? Like, I just don't know how you do that. Like it was in a box with padding. Like, uh, yeah. did you hit it with a car? But the box was intact. It's like, how did you do that with, like, mind powers? Um, anyways, yeah, it's like they, the carriers are impressive, impressive animals. Um, and they're corporations, which means they're technically humans. Every day I can call them animals. Um, but um, so we follow science and we adjust things. And so what we figured out is, like, we have to double bag things, and we changed the way that we fold our bags. We changed the way that we fold the filter patches. We added tracking, right? So every time we make a bag of millet, we have inventory tracking, right? So we know what day, what flow hood, who, and how the grain was handled, right, and how it was made. Because then we package it up, and then we double wrap it. And bio, it's all biodegradable packaging, et cetera. But um, we double wrap it in compost bags, right? So filter patch is covered up, pinned back, everything's all set up. Even then, they'll still blow them up, right? But um, anyway, okay. we uh, follow the data as much as possible. And we do a lot of fruiting trials, and we fail a lot, right? Everyone has contamination. Do not think that for a second just because I don't talk about it every day. I have contamination. You know, not every day, but regularly, right? So um, last week, if you follow me on Instagram, I posted this um, plate pour, right? And I've got this stat, right? It's freaking, I did six bottles. Um, but I had stacked them all single file in front of the flow hood, right? There were five, there were stacks of five plates at the very, very, very top of that stack. And we're talking like maybe they had maybe two inches of clearance from the edge of the flow hood. Then I package the plates, I shrink wrap them, but um, we package them in five packs. I keep the bottles kind of like in separate in order so I kind of know if something went wrong where I effed it up. Um, fair enough, all those stacks went bad in exactly the same time, in exactly the same way. And I said, but nothing else went bad, Jesse. What might the issue be? Oh, that's right. You put them to it too close to the edge of the flow hood and they weren't in flow so they just sat there and went bad. Yeah. 
wait, wait. So, we all have bad days. Um, I do have to be proud that we have a very, very low contamination rate, right? Um, right now, I know it's um, under right around 2% on average. My goal is generally 1% on average, but lately we've been moving fast in, in terms of just like making large batches of runs and saying, hey, listen, if I make, if I cook, on one day I did 42 bottles of liquid culture. If I lose like 10 of those, because I screwed up and I didn't like yeah, either they blew up because I didn't unseal the top or they went bad because I didn't handle them right. Right. It's um, shit happens. Right. You kind of expect for failure. And so what I'll do is like, I didn't need 42 jars, but I made more than I needed because I knew sooner or later I'm going to screw something up. And the harder you try to, I mean, I learned this on pretty early on, the harder oh my I God. fucking tried, it was like the contaminants sought me out. Yes, yes, and yes. That's the thing. And that's out. the thing when you hear me talk. And if you've seen any of my classes or anything, like I'm working on a book and we could talk about that later. But um, it's like that's that's sort of like something I learned in tech. I uh, in my background in tech is large scale distributed systems. So basically the thing that runs the cloud or the thing that rather is the cloud, um, I kind of like help birth it. And I'm sorry, um, you know, the thing that's underneath Amazon. Um, and everybody else. Basically, I stole very, very complex, very, very large distributed systems to capitalists. And I don't feel great about it. I digress. Anyway, um, something that I learned there is, um, and something that's kind of backed in molecular chemistry um, and fungi themselves is like what you really kind of want in the system, and this goes for your company, your grow, your cultivation, is you want small individual things that do one thing or maybe two things demonstrably well, which is if I have a choice between you know, uh, tissue punch, right? Doing my auger work. I have a choice between a tissue punch that has a whole bunch of moving parts and everything else like that, or I have something that is just like, you know, a leather tool, right? That just has a hole and it's made of steel, right? Generally speaking, I'm going to go with the other one. I'm not going to go with the frou frou complex one because I can see and I can deal with that because if something goes wrong with that, it's very easy to diagnose. Right, and then you start there, right? You start very, very low, and that actually goes to the next program too, right? Um, we start from spore, right? We start as low as we can get, right? Because then you start to work it, right? And you start to understand, like, how does this behave, right? Because um, when you start to break it down, <clears throat> that's actually um, called, you know, reductionism, right? Where you're starting to break you know, complex things into, you know, smaller and smaller bits. But that little small thing is less likely to fail, right? Because it is exceedingly simple. So anything I build on top of it theoretically inherits the reliability of the thing I built it on, mm -hmm. right? So that's why if you hear me talk, you know, I'll – say, I'll give a recipe for something. And then people are like, well, what about, but what about, but what about? And I'm like, I don't want, you know, I don't necessarily want to be doing one thing that one or two people are doing or something that I haven't tested extensively, right? I want to be able to do something that I know works over and over and over and over again, right? It's like, get it to a point, a machine could do it. And then you build a machine to do it. Unfortunately, that is also expensive to find out. You know, cultivation gear, like the big machinery that, you know, we all wish we had. We're talking tens of thousands of dollars entry cost. So don't look at envy when somebody's like, uh, yeah, I got this great big soil mixer, or, you know, this giant green dispensing machine, because it's like, right. Oh, and that's how they all sound. They all sound like that when they're talking. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you like a consulting service? 
<laughs> Hi. Oh, yeah. No, I worked in tech. It's like our bread and butter was selling like writers. <laughs> it was like, yeah, you got this consulting server. And then we rolled in this extra server that doesn't do anything, but we're going to charge you for it. And you're going to be cool with it. Okay. Yeah. Right. Anyways. Um, so, yeah, that's a lot about Humble and kind of like kind of like what we're at now. Um, I would say our biggest pain right now is really just time and staffing, right? And it's always like one of those things where, you know, the economy is kind of going to hell in a handbasket. Um, one of the reasons that um, Mushroom Champ, Bradford, and I uh, connected is because it's like, sadly, there's a lot of um, some of us, and I think some people like Mike Ogeeky, myself, and others, we are very exceedingly trusting, right? Um, I'm not an exceedingly paranoid person because unfortunately I've got like Occam's razor tattooed inside of my eyeballs. Um, and um, it's it's easy for me to be like, hey, listen, you know, you sound excited, hardworking and, you know, friendly and we're going to be um, friends and, you know, here, here's everything I own and, you know, let's just can go nuts um not everyone is deserving of that yeah and so like i said the last few years have been really 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 tough and so especially with the economy going to hell in a handbasket and then fucking eight dollar gas like what we invaded countries for a reason no yep good job u.s um but um yeah, so you're grinding. You're you're doing everything right. Oh yeah, no, it's like we're right stuff. It's all good. It's yeah, no, it's like um something stuck in my head back when I first started, and you know I'll talk about that real fast uh, after this. But to this day, there's a video. Uh, if you haven't gotten to watch the videos by uh, PR at Earth Angel Mushrooms, I highly yeah. recommend them on YouTube. Great. He's great. He's great. Um, PR is probably one of the hardest working people in this industry. Um, like me, uh, he's kind of like an improviser and being like, okay, we're going to figure out how to do this. Right. Because unfortunately, mycology and mushroom cultivation, we are the art of using things that were never intended to do the things we want them to do, to do the things we want them to do. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like, why do we sterilize everything 90 minutes? Because we use, pressure cleaners meant for canning things. Not because that's what a laboratory says, but that's how you sterilize food. Right. Right? It's like once you understand kind of like that series of events, right, things kind of like, oh, hey now. Um, but yeah, go and watch TR because the thing that's stuck in my head to this day is like one of his videos, I think it's one of its earliest ones. He's like, don't get into this business until you're willing, uh, unless you're willing to um, put a really long hours and, you know, sacrifice holidays and things like that, especially running this as a business, right? Because, you know, we all know contamination happens. I've had mass contamination that I had to learn the hard way what not to do. Um, I've lost entire crop, you know, it's, it's not all sunshine and upshot. And so it's like one of those things where it's very time consuming. And from a pure stat standpoint, if you go and check, it's um, mushroom cultivation and farming is the second most labor intensive and cost labor in terms of labor cost intensive um, crop to produce in the United States just behind strawberries, which apparently I'm not alone in having a hard time growing. I thought I was just an alien. I was like, what the hell? Why won't these strawberries grow? And then I'm knee deep in my college and I start writing the book and I'm looking at all these stats and everything. And I see that I'm like, holy shit. I am not a space alien. I am not a broken human being because I can't grow strawberries because apparently no one can. Um, so yeah, I, can um, grow strawberries. I don't know, but I mean, maybe I'm in the right place. I think maybe environment might. They, apparently they just need a ton of water. It's a ton of moisture. You mm -hmm. think somebody who grows mushrooms, uh, does it, but it's like actually too much moisture is my enemy. And so I would not try to hazard growing strawberries and mushrooms in the same environment, much less the same tent. Um, yeah. um, 
Real well, quick, so though, you, um, you brought up uh, you brought up the the sterilizing stuff, and we've had some talks, and I, I think that's. Uh, I'm thinking of the different ways that you've pushed my thinking, or we've we've talked about stuff, and I'm like, okay, I guess I got to go read some more uh, journal articles here, because because he's saying some stuff. I, I want to believe him, but I need to read about it. And so far, everything you've said, when I when I go look it up, the science backs it up. So uh, let's talk about what needs to be sterilized. Let's talk about why it needs to be sterilized. Okay, yeah, so, okay. Um, yeah, so this actually ties us to why I uh, kind of, like, started the company, which is um, complex computer systems, mycelial networks, neural networks, and neural uh, pathways when you track the interconnectivity and the networks that they form, they all, and you overlay them, right? You make a map and go, look at it like that. They all kind of look the same, mm -hmm. right? And so that means you've got to follow the data, you've got to follow the science. And so as I looked at mushroom cultivation, you know, I'm on the internet, right? We're all in the streamery. I'm Googling things. I'm watching YouTube things. My first grow, I did not know what I didn't know. And I grew like 60 pounds plus of oyster mushrooms in giant modified monotubs on pasteurized, uh, like manure substrate. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Right. They were good too. And they were huge, but they also look <laughs> right. Um, but at least they didn't need more fay. Like, I actually dialed that in, like, the first try. But um, thank God, because otherwise it would have been, like, one of those nightmares you see on Reddit where somebody's like, what's wrong with my mushrooms? And you're like, oh, 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 oh. did you hold a pillow over them? It's like, damn. Anyways, um, sterilization, right? So science and fact, right, which is, hey, we should probably be able to back up what we say with data. Right, we should be able to understand why something is right. So, let's take sterilization for an example. Right, I just kind of flung a fact out there, which is 90 minutes. Right, a sterilization cup time of 90 minutes. If you go and look at like depression era, like right after uh, World War, I think. Well, yeah, World War One when canning kind of became popular, right? Because uh, canning came about because this. Contest from Napoleon, fast forward to World War One. they're like, holy shit, we can make food that doesn't kill people. And they put it all in a can, right? Ironically, they filled them with lead. America. Um, God. Uh, anyways, so canning, right? So canning, generally speaking, when you're canning, you're using things that are a consistent volume. You're using things that are, you know, fairly high in moisture content and things like that. Um, and so they're also designed, you know, you know, keep the link, ring loose, et cetera. It's like, as I'm talking about canning, are you starting to think about like grain prep, right? Mm -hmm. how about how most of everything you've ever learned about grain prep sounds a lot like a procedure for canning food. Mm -hmm. Now, let's take a step back. Now, me as an engineer, thinking about computer systems and trying to figure out the data, I'm like, okay, so where did this fact come from? Like, how did we get here, <laughs> right? And why is this? Like, why is this the case? And what's reality? Right? And so, you know, fire up Google Scholar, right? And you type in mushroom cultivation sterilization, right? Or you type in sterilization curve, right? And you just keep going. And for me, it's like it became, you know, a minor obsession trying to answer the question of like, hey, why is this the way that it is? And what's the reality? And like, why does my LC have like burnt scorching stuff on the bottom? Like, what am I doing wrong? And what's the real reason? Because I read all these guides, no matter what I did, the net result was always the same. It's like, I'm doing something wrong and it couldn't be this part. Right. Right. And it's like, once you understand why you understand, you begin to understand how, right. And then that turns into a much broader understanding of like how this all pieces together. So sterilization, right? Sterilization is not a factor of pressure, right? So 
mm-hmm. take the idea that you need to have a Presto pressure cooker or any type of pressure holding device to sterilize something because it is false, right? Because if you needed pressure to sterilize things, humankind would have not gotten to this point, right? We would have all died of like multiple different tragedies throughout our evolution because we hadn't figured that out. Um, so sterilization is actor, actually a factor of the temperature you bring a thing to and how long you leave it at that temperature. Sure. Right. This is why you can sterilize cocoa coir sitting on a flat concrete surface sitting in the sunlight. Mm-hmm. Right. If, That's if it why. Up there long enough, yeah. Bingo. Uh, fun fact. Most people think that agaricus by spores growers, you know, only use, you know, composted manure substrate that's fully living and everything else like that. That's actually false. Um, while they do use composted substrate, uh, it's a very hot compost at the end. They do like, I can't remember how many weeks it is, but it's like this multi-week, like hot compost that sterilizes the pile. Instead, what they do is they use a bacterial rick casing layer to trigger pinning in the end of the pinning enzymes. At least that's how commercial growers do it, right? And so that's the other thing, too. Um, mycology and mushroom cultivation, you know, I started to find um, a lot of confusion between commercial cultivators, laboratory scientists, and, yes, you know, home growers, underground mycologists, cultivators, you know, the community, um, Reddit, et cetera. Um, no dick butt. Uh, that is also false. Under certain temperatures, it's a matter of uh, actually moisture, right? Because below a certain temperature, you have to expose it to some level of heat, right? And so UV, UV radiation, that works great. So you can leave it out in sunlight. But yeah, below a certain temperature, and then you start getting into this, like, there's pre-existing moisture, what's going to survive, what's not going to. But if you leave it out sitting long enough, it will eventually, everything in it will die. Right now, you have to talk about endospores and everything else like that, but guess what? The only, re- the only way to get rid of those is, again, time and temperature. Right? Um, so sterilization, you can sterilize it. So pasteurization, let's do a terminology set for a second. Pasteurization is defined, I'm saying defined, and you can Google it. Right, I am not making stuff up. Um, pasteurization is uh, basically, I want to say it's like six to eight hours at 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Right, 160, I, I will pinhead. Um, so 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Not 170, not 180, 160. Now you're probably wondering why exactly 160. Because 160 degrees is where they figured out that for pa- for the effective matter of pasteurization, that's where um, most of your nastiest contaminants and you know the things that are most likely to grow faster than your fungi are going to die off. Mm-hmm. But beyond 160 degrees Fahrenheit, you start killing off all your beneficials, and you start ding 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 sterilizing your substrate. So if you've been pasteurizing for any amount of time, so an extended period above 160 degrees Fahrenheit, you've actually been sterilizing to a degree. Not a perfect sterilization, but more sterile than you thought. Right, and that's actually why a lot of vendors and a lot of other people I see posting texts and things like that, I kind of want to leave a polite comment. I'm like, Okay, anyway. when you whisper, your your voice is cutting off. Sorry. It's It's just like, no, that's not how you think that works. No, not at all. Yeah. Um, I mean, and so, so if, if you go and, Google, is- so go and look, go and look, uh, go, go to Google or anywhere and look up uh, laboratory steam sterilization curve. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not going to talk about this very long because, frankly, it makes my brain hemorrhage. Um, but in short, the papers you're about to read or look at will make your head bleed. Um, so I don't recommend it. Smoke more marijuana. Um, but 
um, what they define is basically in order to kill off X amount of bacterial or living things in Y, you know, your substrate or something else like that, you have to expose it to this amount of um, temperature. In other words, if you were to, say, theoretically just have an oven that was set to, say, 350 degrees Fahrenheit, right, and you just stuck your substrate in, right? Now, in theory, you'd say, oh, wow, I just immediately got that up to 350 Fahrenheit. Wrong, right, because your substrate's cold, right? So you're not immediately nuking it, right? That's why we ramp it up, right? We're overcoming that mass. And so lab sterilization says, okay, if you were to have a device that was operating at this temperature, say 257 degrees Fahrenheit, ED 15 PSI, this is how long you would have to run it to kill off this percentage of the population, right? If you are not running at 15 PSI, ED 257 degrees Fahrenheit, if you're running colder than that, this is how long you have to run it to reach the same effect. Right. And I think I want to say most of those will go down to 160 degrees Fahrenheit, if not 120. Right. Yeah. I think so I you can't say- sterilize at any temperature, but right. <laughs> it becomes a multiple problem of factorial time where it's all of a sudden you go from like six hours or you go from like two and a half hours to like, Six, eight, twenty-four, thirty-two, forty-eight, sixty-four. Like it goes up fast, right? Yeah. To the point of where you're like, okay, so if you're cooking this at like 120 degrees Fahrenheit, go on vacation. <laughs> it's not right. Yeah. Um, oddly enough, this is why micro tech, micro fun, fun fact. This is why microwave tech works. You know, most of the time. Right, because the way that it's heating things is by exciting the molecules of the matter that's sitting there. So, yeah, water. and it's not using exothermic, you know. Right. Anyways. Yeah, you bringing that up, and you brought up TR uh, Earth Angel. He had a video one time that was basically like, "Y'all aren't cooking your grain long enough." And uh, oh, so, and, so, I watched it. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Uh, you, you finish. You finish. You finish. I need to say. I need so, to. Yeah. To so he basically said he was the first guy to. I mean, you know, you can read the pressure cooker chart of if you live in Denver, which you know you you're in a different spot than most of us are. Also, uh, but he, he was the first to say that everybody's you know trying to hit this 15 psi for a certain amount of time they think they're done and he's like it's just not enough time you're especially if you're cooking grain bags that you know it's not hitting that temperature internally for the right amount of time and he had been using these little uh those like uh farm troughs i don't know like feed troughs yeah 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 it's it's, you know those big steel offs that everyone sees everyone build building big steamers out of yeah, they're they're he's just cooking them for a lot fucking longer. They're, they're, it's not as hot. I mean, so the pressure is it doesn't matter. It's the pressure gets you a certain equivalent temperature. But he, he was he was the first guy that I ever heard said, you know, low and slow, he felt was vastly superior for grain prep. And the guy would know he's selling a lot of fucking grain. I know that. Jesus Christ. So anyway, yeah, I, I you know, <laughs> like yeah. one day. One day, I hope to be, I hope to have half of TR's problems. Anyways, um, so yeah, so sterilization. So TR is uh, another one that like, because I was having contamination issues, you know. So what I realized, and TR helped spark that in the back of his head, because I had been extending my sterilization times trying to find the sweet spot. And he was like, dude, two and a half hours. Yeah. So then I went to Google Scholar, then I went to PubMed, then I went to Sci-Hub, then I went to, then I went to, sure enough, right? Here's what you're trying to do with sterilization, right? You should be sterilizing everything, and I'll go into that next. How's that? Um, but um, effectively, what you're looking at is if you've got a given substrate, right? You put that substrate in, the, and by substrate, I mean, you know, any type of substrate, uh, manure substrate, hardwood substrate, et cetera, uh, also grain. Grain counts as a substrate, right? Mm-hmm. If you put any of that 
substrate into a one quart jar, right? And you put in, put it into a stovetop sterilization or stovetop pressure cooker, right? Everything you read says that every all the matter inside of that quart jar will be sterile within, you know, ninety minutes. Yeah. Reason why? Volume and density, right? Physics. The like, I've got a pug who's blind and diabetic, and he mostly sleeps. He's the thing that reminds me that physics is still operating every day. I kind of look at him like gravity is still working. We're great, right? <laughs> Means I can still sterilize things. Um, so um, you're overcoming density. And then as you add supplementation, right? So the more sugars, the more matter that isn't, you know, finely, finely ground or in more of a mineral form. Um, basically the more manure, the more, um, moisture, the more, the more basically anything except for like pure carbon, mm -hmm. right? So you're thinking pure sawdust and pure cocoa and berm, right? Um, you know, it's not going to get sterilized in the same amount of time. Something like just pure cocoa or just a glass jar of like jelly is going to get sterilized in, right? Because as you add supplementation, right? What you're inviting is basically not contamination, but you're inviting a more bacterial aligned substrate and all told, right? So the higher your sugars, the higher your moistures, the higher your nitrogen, the lower your lignin, lower your um, transient elements, your minerals and things like that. Basically, it's kind of like an inverse system, right? Um, and that higher those sugars, the higher that rogue stuff, the higher your rate of contamination, right? Because that invites a lot more bacterial to the party. It invite it turns your substrate into something that is more bacterial aligned. And if you want to know more about what that means, um, Teeming with Bacteria is the book you should go read. Um, it's it's quite good, and um, I was geeked out about the chapter on Archaea for like months. Anyway. Um, so sterilization, right? So not everything. So if you go and read guides, they're going to say 90 minutes, 90 minutes, 90 minutes. It's like, okay, but I have a question for you. What is the density of that matter, right? Is it a liquid? Is it a solid? Is it something that is very porous? In other words, very airy. Is it, you know, what's the moisture level like? I've got questions. <laughs> what are you cooking? Um, the answer is they never say what they're cooking. They just kind of take this 90 minute benchmark and they say, okay, everything in that system is going to be sterile. It's like, I got bad news for you, right? When you use commercial sterilizers, the first thing they tell you is if you think it's going to sterilize the same amount of time as that soap off thing you're running. It's like, right. you should pay us more money. <laughs> we have a bridge to sell you. Um, yeah, no, the first thing they tell you is that you're going to have to extend your trip time no matter what, right? Because number one, uh, for master's mix, right? That's a 50% supplemented blend, right? So it's 50% hardwood, carbon, lignin, cellulose, you know, all that good stuff. And nitrogen, so soy husk or something similar, right? So it's 50-50. At that point, the risk, like, that is so kind of high on that nitrogen, cellulose, you know, sugar, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff, um, that unless you fully sterilize it, it will go bad, right? It's like, there's no, it's kind of like a binary state, right? And you know when you screwed up a batch of master's mix because it's not shy about it. Um, and so the mix matters, right? So if I was doing say an 80-20 blend, which is traditionally for culinary, that's 80% sawdust and 20% wheat bran, I would not necessarily have the same issue because that's only 20% supplemented, not. 50%. Right. Right. And so um, the higher your supplementation, the more you want to sterilize. Right. Um, and like you, it's like TR, TR did the tickle, and I was like, oh, oh, that explains so much physics. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Cool. Um, so, yeah, if, if y'all want to have a quick tip on like what I would tell the first person so like nine times out of ten a lot of my consults and things like that are like 
I have contamination. How do I get rid of it? I'm like, okay, here's how you debug it. Number one, took it longer. Right, you sterilize it. Um, and what I usually tell them is like our default. So in my shop, in my lab, in my book, the minimum sterilization type for any type of brain is 2.5 hours. Mm -hmm. Minimum. Right? Why is that? Because you're not going to scorch it or burn it if you don't have it at a scorch point longer than, say, a minute. Right? So, for example, the, the, um, the oxidation point of grain is very, very, it's much, much higher, right, than you think, right? And so when you're burning things, right, what you're doing is you're getting that exposed to, like, superheat for a prolonged amount of time, right? That's why things pop when they're exposed to the sidewall, et cetera, right? It's not because your grain prep is off. It's because of physics, yeah. right? Um, and so um, our minimum cook time is two and a half hours. And the reason why is I know... No matter what I'm packing it in, no matter what the supplementation level is, two and a half hours will always hit that center point, given uh, basically a, what's, what are those Prestos, 26 quart, 28 quart, I can never 23. remember. Mm -hmm. 23. 23. Yeah. Oh, quiet. Right. Mm -hmm. um, no, there's no adjustments for moisture levels, Dick, but <laughs> it's always 2.5 hours, right? Uh, 2.5 hours, it's 2.5 hours for every block of substrate that goes through a pressure cooker. That includes our manure base, that includes our CDG blend. Um, yeah, I know some of you are like, um, basically anything that goes through there, that goes through that pressure cooker, that is an auger or liquid culture goes through for two and a half hours, right? But it goes in for a two and a half hours where we never exceed the oxidation slash scorch point, right? So when we're bringing it up, we ramp fast. But as soon as that rocker hits 15 PSI, we drop the tank, right? right? Or 16 PSI because we're at elevation, sorry. Um, 15 if you're not at elevation, right? So when I hit 16 PSI, we drop the tank. We actually set it on a timer at a specific wattage, mm -hmm. right, for that amount of time because the reason why you're getting um, – like nasty proteins and burns in your liquid culture or in your auger, or you're getting like scorched brains and things like that, is because you're getting it too damn hot for too long. Yeah. Right? That's what happens, right? That's why caramelization happens. That's why your auger, when you do that, when you're like, haha, I'm going to cut a corner by doing 20 PSI, doo -doo -doo -doo, you know, physics is sitting behind you. It's that meme with the two wrestlers, like the one like, and the guy behind him, like, Arr. Um, or actors or whatever it is, right? Um, it's like you can't cut corners, right? Going to 20 PSI for half the time is not the same, right? Even sucking 10 minutes off that cook time is not the same, right? You're getting it hot, but you're not overcoming the density or the matter or anything else like that. That The stuff that you're sterilizing is still a heat sink. You still have to overcome the temperature variant. This is also why... If you saw my Instagram the other day, uh, temperature variance, watch out for this, right? Do not take glass objects that are like, say, fresh out of a pressure cooker and set them on very cold surfaces yeah. or say drop them into a sous vide bath that was sitting in an ice cold lab overnight. So technically it was 30 Celsius off of. Yeah. yeah so anyways, two bottles of water exploded. Yeah. Anyways, that's how that ended. Um, so anyways, sterilization, it's our minimum cook time is two and a half hours, right? And we achieve that by putting a trivet that's about an inch, uh, yeah, it's about two to two and a half inches tall in the bottom of all of our pressure cookers, not our all American. Do not apply what I'm saying to all Americans that have the, uh, double boiler design, only the pressure canners, right? The ones that do not have like the double boiler with an insert and, you know, the, the basket that you pull in and out of an All-American, that is a special design. That is not the same as a Presto. So ignore that. Yeah, please. I get like, um, some poor guy uh, 
use, I want to say, a heavy-duty plate on top of his AA, and it's like the steel contact to that aluminum build of theirs, it's like it superheats the plate, right? It's going to burn and melt everything on top of it. Anyways, um, so we put a trivet in the bottom that's about two, two and a half inches tall, and we had about three and a half to four quarts of water. Then we set the timer on our induction plates. So we use uh, uh, induction Prestos and our barrel sterilizer to do grain. Um, I'll talk about, uh, if people want to hear about that, we can talk about that. But yeah, um, so Prestos, yeah, we just put that water in there. We set a timer for two and a half hours, we'll walk away. Depends on how much you run. Oh, yeah. So um, the reason why you never run pressure device is half loaded. So actually, I got to talk about the barrel. Okay, so for those who don't know, I are the humble fungus. Um, I have a problem. I am, I am an unforgiving geek and engineer um, by nature. Um, unforgiving, <laughs> right? And also, I'm a super geek. So if you notice any naming trends, it's... Um, I am a huge science, physics, and other geek, so all of our stuff is named after moons or things in the expanse right now. I'm so waiting for the method. Europa blend. That's the one I'm waiting for. I can't talk about that. Um, anyways. <laughs> Actually, the Europa blend will look like this, like, hard substrate on the outside, but it'll be, like, moist water and, like, gold fit in the center. Um, anyways. That was a deep cut. Uh, sorry. Uh, so barrel sterilizers and why you don't want to run pressure devices half filled or similar, right? So when you're running a pressure device, if you say run your pressure pressure canner empty, right? You just put like two cups, three cups of water in the bottom, and you put it on the stove top, put the lid on it, and you let it run. It's going to take an astonishing amount of time to heat up. And then it'll take even longer to hit pressure. Why? Steam sterilization and pressure. In order to have pressure, you need to have steam. In order to have steam create pressure, you have to constrain the steam. Ergo, the volume inside of the steam vessel determines if you can reach pressure. Right? And so it's like, for example, yeah, so our barrel sterilizer. When I was designing it, you know, I, I made a lot of mistakes. I was learning as I was going because it's like I looked at bubble barrels and all the other ones that everyone looks at. And I was like, I can't afford $10,000 of anything, <laughs> right? So, um, <clears throat> and then the bubbles, I was like, from a physics standpoint, I can't use them, right? Because up here at elevation, water boils at 202 degrees Fahrenheit. That means I can't hit boiling at 212, which means my cook time for a vented environmental steamer is like two to three X longer than it should be, which sucks wrong. Um, ergo, I built a sterilizer, right? But when I was building it, I couldn't figure out why I would never hit pressure, right? I've got everything in it. It's just boiling with, which sounds really impressive, but I was running it empty. And then one day, rationality kicked in, realized it's like, in order, like, we we sell 120 volt ones and 220 volt ones or amp like late. Um, we sell both 120 because 120 is what I have access to and what I think that most cultivators are going to have access to. Right, getting 220 even as a business, getting like a custom build out in a city. The city inspector was like, "You get one," and I was like, "I wanted 10." He's like, "You get one," <laughs> and he kept laughing. Uh, so I got one. Uh, so 220 is really hard to get. So 120, boiling water, generating steam, trying to fit, trying to fill the the empty volume of a 55 gallon drum, even if it's sealed airtight, it's going to take like days. God. <laughs> um, so that's why you never run it at right. So it takes twice as long. And then if you've got air pockets, which tend to build up the more kind of like loose space you have in it, then it's sterilizing. If you have stuff sitting in water, anything below that water line ain't getting yeah. sterilized. Yeah. Why? 
here, I get this question a lot because everyone says bullshit that, you know, I've got jars sitting in water and they sterile all the time. I'm like, great. It's, it's like the lottery, right? Everything we do isn't negating risk. We're trying to minimize risk, right? Like all scientists, right? We're trying to like break things up. No, no, no. Um, so specialty, hold on a second. Um, so when you're looking at a pressure cooker, anything below the water, so if you have jars or substrate sitting in pools of water, water boils at, if you're not at elevation, it boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Um, anything below that water line is going to be pretty much stable at 212, give or Wait, not really. It's kind of variable, right? So basically anything sitting in underneath that water is kind of like a crapshoot as to whether or not it's going to get sterilized. If you cook it long enough and the water evaporates low enough, et cetera, it will work, right? If you basically run out of water every cook, right? that's terrible. You'll burn your house down. Um, but you get what I'm saying, right? Which is... Um, anything below that water line isn't exposed to the superheated steam it's supposed to, right? Correct. Steam has to hit everything. It has to hit the bottom. It has to go up underneath those jar lids. It has to go inside of the bag. It has to eat all of those molecules, all the water molecules that are sitting inside of that jar, right? Because the steam isn't going inside, right? The steam is holding the stasis around those vessels or about around the things that you're cooking, and it's getting those particles, uh, water particles in there, nice and hot. Those are creating steam. Those are what's causing sterilization, right? This is why if you steal your bags or steal your jars and you cook them, that's why they explode. Don't steal things. Don't steal things that's going to press your devices tightly. Ever. Um, that's how you blow things up. And I have done so. Oh, God, I had to throw out an entire pressure cooker because I blew up a bottle of lager because I feel the lid tight. Mm. It was like, you pull that out, and you're like, mm. I ain't clean of that. <laughs> like, there's no rescuing that. Um, so, yeah, so basically, if I'm cooking it two, two and a half hours, I have to use, because also it's exceedingly dry here, I have to use about three to uh, three to three and a half, three to four liters of water, depending. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, in the bottom, and then we use a trivet to raise everything out of the water, Bob's your uncle, right? We, as long as we change the water, right? So here's the other thing. If you're sterilizing things, if you ain't cleaning that vessel with like bleach and letting it dry every couple of days and you're just letting water sit in the bottom, et cetera, you're contaminating yourself. <laughs> So, uh, so here's the bad news about sterile water. Um, it's also how we discovered that most contamination can't traverse a 90 degree angle, right? Um, it's basically, um, Jesus Christ, what was it about? I just forgot the thought. Pressure cooking, anyway. three, oh, three yeah. fourths of water. Oh yeah, so three, three, four fourths of water. Um, and so unless we fuck up the oh, cleaning, God, Jesus, oh my lord. Um, so if you take an open vessel back, back in like I think seventeen, sixteen, seventeen hundreds, um, everyone thought that like bacteria and rot and disease would just and rats, like they thought mice would just pop out of dead people spontaneously, like it was God's will, like oh shit, little Billy just died. And just rats, just God's will. It's like, um, no, <laughs> right? So, um, some scientists, basically, a uh, very clever scientist, uh, made a flask that had um, two types of angles, right? It had kind of like an input neck thing. One was not at a 90 degree angle, so it was kind of curved. One was at a 90 degree angle, and one was straight, et cetera, right? And he put sterile water in there. Then he let it sit. Basically, the bottles that did not have the 90 degree angle contaminated within a few hours. Right. Within the week, they started turning into like the primordial pools of early earth. Right. It's like, ooh, what's the color there? Uh, maybe lipstick mold. Right. But the one with the 90 degree angle did not go bad. Right. Because unlike humans and monkeys, bacteria and other contaminants, and also, you know, 
random spores flying through the air, generally speaking, aren't going to go, unless you're sucking air through the fucking bottle, like they aren't going to like fly up and just be like, oh, look, under the angle, I'll, I'll grab that, right? They like curves and straight lines. Um, yeah. So um, if you're not cleaning your stuff, if you're not pouring the water out, so my sous vide machine, I've got to clean that out when I'm using it for auger and things like that. Sterilizers, we got to clean those out. Um, the barrel sterilizer is less of an issue because it burns off a lot of water just because of the amount of mass. No matter how sealed you get something like that, there's always going to be the steam outlet. And the way we designed it is that it auto vents, right? Because I don't like to build things that blow people up. <sighs> mm. I've got stories. Um, but uh, so at auto vents, uh, it's something I think the pressure valve, it says 15 PSI, but I think in reality, through an engineering feat, it's like 14.999997 PSI. And so it auto bleeds, right? So it lets off steam. So we have to hook a garden hose up to it. Otherwise, it will run out of water, filling up that amount of mass, et cetera, right? right? Um, so we don't necessarily have to cycle the water on that nearly as fast because, God, it goes through. Um, at least until I fix ours, because I send the nice things out to customers and we get, <laughs> like, literally, we use test bags a lot. <laughs> it's like, I need a green bag to knock. And it's like, from every batch, we take a, ra a couple of random bags and set them aside, just be like, shelf test, right? Um, that's the other thing, actually. I should probably stop talking. Jesus. I went full extrovert cannon on y'all. I'm sorry. I don't get out much. Um, but, um, yeah, so if you're trying to figure out where things are going wrong, right? And I struggled with this as a newbie, but I'm lucky because I had dealt with, you know, systems comprising hundreds of thousands of machines spread across, you know, multiple geographies and, you know, God knows what else. Um, and so I'm kind of used to having to think about like, oh, shit. You know, where could this entire system kind of be going wonky, right? It, not everything should be going bad. In other words, like everything going bad is a red flag, right? Everything going bad, it's your cook and prep or your air. <laughs> cook, prep, or air, right? Um, and so um, it's kind of like one of those things where it's like you apply Occam's razor, which if you're not familiar with it, or if you are familiar with it, let me do a quick thing. And I go over this in the book, and it's a tiny little soapbox I have, which is Occam's razor. Um, I can't remember the original phrasing because it's that old school, weird Latin English that's hard to say. Um, but Occam's razor basically dictates that the given a given problem, in other words, if you're trying to figure out why something went wrong or why something went awfully terribly bad, Right. Given a list of options, usually nine times out of 10, you know, most times the least complex is the answer. Right. And you might think, well, oh, but, you know, that's missing context. It's missing this, it's missing that. It's like, no, what you have to think about is like the world is exceedingly selfish and naive and things generally aren't that complex. Right, it's uh, the military. I was a military kid, so it's like they, it's, the reason why they say is like, if you've got two people who know a secret, it's not a secret. Right, it's kind of like one of the things where it's like, mm, um, anyway, I forgot what I was saying too. I forgot that too. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking through here some of the uh, questions. Um, oh, God. The systems problems. It? Yeah, yeah. So systems problems, right? Uh, Occam's razor. Jesus Christ. Like, it's really late for me. Sorry. It's uh, I'm old, and I'm an early riser. Um, I'm 42 now, by the way. It's like, ew, I made terrible life decisions. Anyways, um, debugging these problems, what I've found time and time again is like, Okay, if I was, so in the early days, I bought all my stuff. Like, for a little while, I resold other people's grains, et cetera, right? Because either I didn't think I could do it or I didn't have confidence, right? And I bought a lot of other people's stuff, right? Um, and time and time and time again, right, you have an issue. You have a contamination, right? And so 
for example, you buy a grain bag and it's sitting there and it's completely contamination free. And it's like, I would do this. I'd buy them off of Amazon. I'd buy them off of Etsy. I'd buy them off the fucking street, right? Give me a grain bag. Come on. As long as it's sterile, I don't even care. Pork jar. <clears throat> Man, I had tens of jars of corn, right? It's stocking. Terrible. Um, but uh, so time and time again, right? Every time I'd have something go wrong, it's like, okay, so sure, it's, um, you could blame, you know, your lack of a laminar flow hood. You could blame, you know, your vendor. I mean, even though it was clean when you got it, blame the vendor. You could blame any number of things, right? But what is probably the simplest answer? So, for example, um, one of my big um, contamination issues, right? It was, I was sitting there and I remember um, that was, everything was overly complex, right? I had communication systems. I had like an AC unit. I had all these parts, all this shit flying around. Because I was like, as most of us, I can, when we started, it's like, at least I did. It's like, I went overboard, right? It was like looking at designs for shotgun fruiting chambers, thinking like, you know what? You know what would make that better? Air compressor. <laughs> You're like, let's make this hard. <laughs> so we, we end up getting really discouraged because we kind of, follow things and we kind of make it overly complex. And so what I'd realized is like, oh, the reason why everything went bad is because I just wasn't cooking it long enough. Or the reason why it all went bad is because I hadn't changed the water in the pressure cooker in like two months. Yeah. Or the reason why it all went bad Clean. is I didn't change the pre-filter on my flow hood. Yep. Change it a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So basically, it's like if you're looking to kind of like figure out why everything's kind of going wrong, simplify, right? Your simplest fruiting chamber on the planet, right? You go and get a wire shelf. For that wire shelf, you get wheels because everything needs wheels. Trust me. Yes. This is me, 42 year old me, going back in time, telling you put wheels on everything. Um, I'm not even being consistent. Um, get a wire shelf, um, get a, um, they're usually called dust covers, get a transparent one, right? They, so what they are is like, there are these dust covers that they'll sit on top of the top shelf and they've usually got like a zipper door on the front or on the side or something like that. You get that, put that over that wire shelf, being a cleaner, ideally with bleach, uh, ideally with, uh, hypochlorous acid, different subject. Um, but we go. That's the, yeah. then you go and you go, hold on, you go to Amazon or you go to Walgreens and you go and get a $20 or $30 humidifier. Like the blue water droplet humidifiers, right? They're about $20. The great thing is there's no filters. They're ultrasonic. They're easy to clean. You can see all the crooks and crab crevices. You get one of those $20. I think our price tag right now is if you're not buying the commercial stuff, I think we're at like two hundred fifty dollars all told, all in. And then you go to Amazon, you buy an Inkbird humidity controller, right? And that a humidity controller basically senses what the humidity is and will turn the power on and off on something. Humidity low, turn something on. Humidity too high, turn something on. But you don't give a shit. Uh, you don't care about that. Um. But um, you go get the wire shelf, you put the dust cover on it. The reason why you want a clear one, unless you're uh, trying to be discreet, is because you can use natural light. In fact, you probably should. Um, exposing um, your uh, mushrooms to vitamin uh, to UV uh, late in the freeing cycle, just after harvest, actually increases their vitamin D content and uh, helps uh, a I gotta reread the study, but it's like supposedly digestion, but it, I don't know. This is kind of like a subjective thing. Um, bleach versus ISO. Bleach. Bleach, then ISO. Bleach, comma, then ISO. Bleach works by destroying the protein, right? It, it's like it go, bleach goes in, it's like, it, it's 
it's an oxidizer. <clears throat> like I'm going to get your cells and like destroy your proteins. <sighs> right? Uh, isopropyl sterilizes, or rather, uh, disinfects via a completely different method. Right? So bleach, you want to use you know a five to ten percent bleach solution, and you want to get it nice. You want to get it all over the place, and you want to wipe it down, but you want to let it dry because bleach does not function unless it dries. Period. Right? So if you've got a bunch of wet bleach or bleach that hasn't dried sitting on something, that surface is not disinfected. Um, then you use isopropyl because isopropyl, number one, dries faster than bleach and works through a different method. Isopropyl works through evaporating the moisture cells, right? So isopropyl, for example, if you get a bottle of like 99 hundred percent pure isopropyl. There's a giant warning on it, which is like, um, it like evaporates water, right? You add pure iso to water. It's like, Oh, Oh, where'd the water go? Oh, right. Um, so yeah. Um, but, um, going back to some, uh, simple fruiting chamber, right? You go and you get, um, that little simple, uh, um, humidifier, little twenty dollar it's blue, it's clear, it's plastic. There's like a bajillion of them on Amazon. Um I'm pretty sure every cannabis bio store on the planet has like at least fifty of them. Um anyways, um you go and get one of those. You get the RH controller that controls the humidity. You plug the humidifier into the RH controller, right? And then you take whatever mushrooms, however you're fruiting them, put them in there, and you put it in a place that has access to bright, intense light. Right, don't keep them in the dark. They actually, it's a false, it's a, it's a myth that, like, agaricus vice does not like a light of light. However, comma, most of the mushrooms and varieties we grow uh, love orchid conditions, is what it's usually called, right, which is bright, intense, diffused light. Right, so this is why um, small amounts of UV, they love, like, they respond really, really well to uh, UV bats. But it can't be very long because UV also scorches them and sunburns them. Right. Um, so sunscreen? yeah. So, yeah. No. No. Uh, so I actually. So and UVC. Don't go near it. It's not worth it. Unless you're putting it inside of like an air ducting system or something. It's like UVC is great and all, but it's you can't resist the urge to look at it. Um, having UVC near you, looking at it. It will sunburn your eyes. It will sunburn your skin. I have seen the nastiest fucking injuries on people, like literally sunburning their eyeballs from looking at fucking UVC, right? It does its job, but it ain't worth the risk, right? Go and get something like bleach or hypochlorous acid, right? Even taking a 10% bleach solution and putting it in a fogger and kind of like misting the air helps way more than like UVC will help in that regard nice so yeah talk uh, about hypochlorous oh god so okay so we're in a simple fruiting chamber right so i recommend if you've got a fruiting setup like that you grow in bags right and you do hoodie tech or bag tech or whatever tech you want to use i call it hoodie tech there's a bunch of videos i've got up on youtube about it um and you fill it with full of that but you're probably wondering how do i keep contamination down like You've got a humidifier, man. Like, how for, how frequently do I got to clean it, dog? And it's like, trust me. There's a reason I make a lot of memes and post them about, like, not cleaning your fucking humidifier or your air filters because I'm usually the first asshole who does it. I'm like, what's that smell? It smells kind of fishy. You open up the, you open up the humidifier, you're like, oh, somebody has been bad boy not cleaned that. Right? Um. So humidifiers aren't to be feared. It's like if you've got a little grill like that, you've got a little humidifier like that, take it, wash it once a week with five to ten percent bleach solution, done. Right? Let it dry. Um but if you want to say prevent airborne pathogens, contamination, if you want to sterilize a large commercial space with a fogger, or you say want to irrigate wounds. Um, try magical electric water. Okay, uh, hypochlorous acid. 
Uh, this is actually one of my favorite tools in the modern mycologist tool belt, or at least modern cultivators tool belt. Um, <clears throat> if you do a Google search for hypochlorous acid or HOCl, you'll find a uh, document from on the National Institute of Health called hypochlorous acid, a review. Um, so this goes over, it's sort of like a meta study of all bunch of studies, like most meta studies are like meta, meta, meta studies, weird. Um, anyways, when you go through that, uh, it actually describes kind of like the problem that they had around COVID, right? Which is, as we all know, sterilization gear, medical gear, et cetera, was getting exceedingly hard to get. Not to mention with airborne pathogens, you have the fundamental problem. Air is everywhere and air is your enemy. <gasps> that maybe means that mushroom cultivators have the same problem, right? As like a hospital or a lab or, you know, a surgeon, right? Where we need to keep, we need to be able to sterilize or at least disinfect, right? Not sterilize, but disinfect a large sweeping area very, very, very quickly. Obviously, fogging, fogging space, spraying pure chlorine into the air, or spraying chlorine into a pool, et cetera. That's all known stuff. But um, for a long time, uh, there had been more and more research around using electrolysized water, right? So as we've gotten better at molecular chemistry and stuff like that, what we found is like um, uh, hydrogen peroxide exists in all most, I think, mammals and even fungi, uh, certain species of fungi generate it, right? Um, it's just an enzyme, it's, it's an oxidizer, right? It's just like one of those chemicals on the planet that just like lives in the world and we take it and we concentrate it, right? The same is true for chlorine, right? Na like chlorine isn't like a natural thing, right? It's concentrated, right? It's like when we have, when we're worried about like chemical weapons and things like that, that's humans going and concentrating something, turning it into a gas and then spraying it all over something, right? Bleach, believe it or not, bleach is also electrolysized water. Bleach, okay. usually the bleach that most consumers buy, isn't made from like chlorine that you think of like when you're shocking a pool or, you know, people are like getting gas from World War II or something else like that, right? Um, instead, what it is is that when you take, when you take a living thing and you take a little bit of chemistry, right, you take um, salt, Right, so the salt is the magic thing, um, and you take an agent like vinegar, and you suspend it in water, and then you apply electricity to it. What ends up happening is that the chemical reaction unleashes, or basically creates, or helps form naturally occurring chlorine ions. Right, and so all of a sudden, this water it just turns into a very, very, very safe, non-harmful, quick dissipating uh, chlorine-based cleaner, right? So it basically it's electric, electric current applied to salt and vinegar water, right? So when you go and buy bleach, the difference between bleach and hypochlorous acid, like I'm talking about, is the type of salt, right? So, um, hypochlorous acid. When you go and read the NIH. And I, it's NIH review or when I talk about it is usually made with like kosher salt or sea salt, right? It's a very simple salt compound. It's not particularly shelf safe when put into a solution, much less put through the electrolysis process, right? So this is why hypochlorous acid has a drawback, which is it's got a very short shelf life and you have to keep it very, very airtight. So it can't just oxidize into the environment. It oxidizes very quickly. Right, commercial bleach is made from a different salt compound and then concentrated, right? So then that way they get shelf stability. Um, later piece that. Um, so, hypochlorous acid. What they found in the review and what they found is, is during COVID, they said, oh shit, how do we do this? Well, all the research on hypochlorous acid shows that, A, it's safer than hydrogen peroxide for surgeries, irrigation, you know, sensitive procedures because since it's naturally occurring and it just dissipates so quickly into its like native salt and just like it just goes away. It just really dissipates really fast. It's a lot 
safer than something like hydrogen peroxide, which will actually like burn a hole in your skin in a high enough concentration left long enough, right? Um, so what they realized is that if you put hypochlorous acid, say if you took, and so hypochlorous acid like bleach comes in like PPM. So you've got to get kind of familiar with different PPMs. So like 200 parts per million is a relatively weak hypochlorous acid solution, but it's good enough to like, you could probably drink it. Right. I mean, you're going to taste the swimming pool, but it's not going to necessarily harm you. Right. Um, but what you can use that 200 ppm solution for is you can take it and put it in a fogger and you can take a contaminated cake and breathe the spirit out of it. But mm -hmm. if it's a stubborn stain and that trike just won't come out, try a new 400 ppm HOCL um, or 800, right? Um, the nice thing about HOCL and the fact that fungi and humans have so many shared genetic and just so much your DNA and RNA and our cell walls kind of follow the same type of like construction, et cetera. It's like they don't get hurt by it. Right. So you can take 800 PPM hypochlorous acid and you can put it in a fogging machine, like a fogger, not a misting bottle. That's not fine enough. Cause the point is you want to like turn it into a fine mix, like an ultra sonic humidifier. Christopher Nolan. Yeah sound right so what they realize is in hospitals if you take an ultrasonic humidifier or equivalent thereof in hospital terms which is generally the way of protein more um and you put diluted hypochlorous acid into it and you turned on that ultrasonic water it would basically uh disinfect the air and keep it disinfected so basically you could pump this stuff into a hospital and keep it from developing horrible COVID outbreaks and things like that in theory. It doesn't work, obviously, because it doesn't work. It's not foolproof because when we talk, we spit. And so if you're not masked up, you like spit in people's faces and shit happens, right? Um, but it was going to keep anything that's like chilling out in the air, like spores and things like that, just wipe it off the face of the planet. Yeah. Right? Nice. So you put it in a fogger and you get those dirt cheap on Amazon. And you take a contaminated tub and you just fog it, right? You just take it and you just, where you'd normally be misting, you just fill that entire tub with that hypochlorous acid fog and you close it. And you walk away and you wait. The next day, what you're going to notice is the contamination is going to look way different. It's going to start pulling back and things like that. If it doesn't, you do it again and you keep doing it. And either it goes away in the first couple of treatments or you use like an 800 ppm solution for some, something like really bad trike and you just broke it, right? So you can take, right, a hoodie tech bag, right? Say you're bag fruiting. you got your substrate in there. you got the rubber band. you got the hood and everything. That thing can have blue-green mold or trike dripping down the side, right? You could pull that clear plastic bag up and be like, dude. You've grown try level two, uh, right? You can take that and you can take that 800 ppm uh, hypochlorous acid and you can just fucking just spray it all over the cake. Just like mop it on there, just like dunk it in there, just mop it off, right? And it won't hurt the fungus. In fact, <laughs> the fungus will end up like absorbing a certain amount of the moisture and, you know, different molecules that just end up hanging around mostly like hydrogen ions, stuff like that, whatever happens during the decay process, right? Um, so it doesn't hurt them. So you can actually recover the contaminated tubs, blocks. You can keep contamination down in fodder. You can recover this stuff just by, like, soaking this stuff. You can take, like, you can load it up into a syringe. And so this is actually a trick. So if you read Radical Mycology, there's a trick in there that says trying to inject brain bags with hydrogen peroxide. Now, if you've ever heard spraying contaminants with hydrogen peroxide, it does work. However, it's not as effective as something like HOCL, right? It's going to take a lot more. And in reality, you're better to remove the infected area and then to spray the remainder with hydrogen peroxide, to be honest. Um, but you can take a very contaminated cake and just basically make a bucket of HOCL, just diluted HOCL, and just pour it, 
scope the cake. So if you're in between flushes and maybe you do a dunk, I'm not joking, just dunk it in diluted HOCL, right? You'll kill any existing contaminants or anything else like that, and you let the fungi thrive. Sounds good to me, man. I'm I'm already keep going back and forth on when I'm going to pull the trigger and buy the hundred fifty dollar one. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's it's, uh, uh, it's interesting. It, you know, I honestly wish I could get a generator that maybe like six gallons every day because that's amazing, right? I mean, it really is just time, like right the the machine. It takes a minute for it to make it. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like generally the consumer machines, like the one I've got, you have to run it a few times. So it runs for like nine minutes and then it shuts off. Then you run it again to increase the PPM. Then you run it again. Then you run it again. Um, I saw one, I think it's like a USB drop in bucket one. And I'm wondering if it doesn't have a timer, then that would be pretty cool because I could just like make a 10 gallon batch at once, like put a cup of coaster salt and then like, God, I hate the smell of vinegar. Yeah. Um, it's also why I hate the smell of RTD. Um, yeah. So, uh, Metal Hetty wondered, um, would uh, hypochloric work in a steamer? I'm, I think so, he's thinking green application. So, a uh, little secret that I do, right? So, bleach is pretty cost. Uh, I mean, bleach will oxidize and rust and like trigger all sorts of nastiness, right? Because it's fairly caustic in that regard. So you don't want to put you don't want to put it in the reservoir unless it's super ultra diluted, right? Um, hold on a second. Uh, sorry. Um, somebody was like, "Are you okay?" And I'm like, "Yes, I am alive." Um, so you don't want to put bleach in like reservoirs and things like that, but. I do put it in the bottom, like when I go and clean my pots and everything, uh, especially when I'm like cooking auger and things in the lab or LC, especially with my little all American, what I'll do is like, I'll fill the res up and then I'll probably put in like a cup or two of just not particularly strong. I have chlorous acid. Usually I've diluted a bunch by then anyways. But what's nice is that when it turns into that fog, it will also help keep, keep that space clean. Right, so I can leave stuff sitting in the pot for a little bit longer than I would normally. Basically, as long as you turn it into a water vapor or a fine fog, good to go. It were okay. Nice. Uh, all right. What well, we had a couple other questions we went past here. Here we go. Primal Disco. Would it be beneficial to put a scoop of powdered activated carbon into your substrate mix? Oh yeah. Let's let's do a little bit of a sub talk. Um, add you know everybody's just dying to add shit to their their cocoa core, so let's talk about what 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 works and what doesn't. Oh, I, I, do you want to talk about what fungi crave? Um, exactly. It's tint. It's electrolyte. Um. So Gatorade. Yes. Yes, these are these are Gatorade. Gatorade. I mean, that's what Oregon, now that they're decrimming and everything, they've already said you can only use cocoa and burn because pathogens. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, why don't you take people who would fail a fucking high school chemistry class and put them in charge, right? Um, so, substrates, sterilization, etc. So, uh, without going on a really long thing, which is all in my book, um, if I'm writing a book. Uh, it is available for pre-order up on the site. In fact, anything I'm kind of talking about, there's some YouTube videos. If you go to humblefungus.com, I've got the book pre-order. It's like I'm trying to get a new up-to-date draft up there um, because I've got most of the flesh for the first edition. Um, but um, soil science. Okay. Most of everything you've ever heard about your substrates in the mushroom cultivation world online or on YouTube is flat. Like, I'm just going to go out and say it, okay? So here's a little lie. When I first started, you know, I wanted to scale up my grow real fast, and I said, okay, so um, the reason why I got into growing fungi in the first place is I really sucked at growing, like, cannabis and vegetables and everything else like that. I didn't really understand, like, soil chemistry and things like that, so I went and learned it. <laughs> right? It was like, this sucks. And of course, when you're learning, you know, about the food web and you're learning about how to grow better vegetables and things like that, one of the first things you slam into are mushrooms and fungi, right? And it's like, man, you want to get this shit, right? You want to have your mycorrhizals. You want to have your endos, your ectos, your 
your Bob and Nancy ones, whatever's going to pair with that cannabis plant, get those great big nugs. You want that. Just put all the mushrooms, right? Uh, in fact, cannabis growers use uh, non-fruiting species of mushrooms for like CO2 bags in their tents, right? Um, mushrooms are just really, fungi are tied soil, right? So I went and learned soil science. And then I went and I also learned, quote unquote, the state of the art of mycology, like the various substrate blends and things like that. Um, and as I learned more and as time passed and the more I studied, the more I realized that it's like, you know, mycology is really like mushroom, our, our community, like the mycology community, the cultivator community. It's like, it were incredibly fractured. We stop, like, there's, it's a carpet sticking it up, dog. Um, every time I open my mouth. Um, so it's like, we're very fractured. Right, so mycology, right? So mycology is very, very, very young. It wasn't until like, I wanna say, God, fungi were added in like, oh, I'm not even gonna try to quote the dates in the book. I usually have it memorized, but I can't remember. But we're very young science. And one of the big things that everyone has to understand is that the people who work in mycology full time, in other words, the science of mycology, are pretty much in the industry of like bread, cheese, wine, industrial cleaners, industrial enzymes, um, they are working in labs, right? They're not trying to cultivate, you know, edible mushrooms at scale, right? They're not, they're not concerned about that, right? Um, the harsh news for therapeutic, you know, defenses and therapies and things like that, guess what? You want to know where those therapists are getting their psilocybin? Not from a mushroom. Mm -mm. It's from a bioreactor where they probably have something like E. coli and they extracted like E. coli as a really dumb bacterium, and so or virus. Jesus Christ. Um, and so, yeah, it, all it does is it just replicates whatever DNA packets inside of it. It's like so stupid. And so, what you do is you go to a fungus, right? And you find out the the DNA structure that actually makes you know psilocybin, and you take that out and you CRISPR it, its ass into the E. coli, you drop that into a bioreactor, and you're still excited. Right. Right. So if you look at this, it's like no one's really trying to mesh modern mycology science. Like if you go and read like the modern science of trichoderma, holy shit. Like they know so much. They know like what pH stops mycelating at. They know all the different species. They know the ones that are going to like be the worst. They know the bacteria that you can add to a substrate that will go and kill it. Yeah. Right. It's like science is cool, but no one really talks about it. And it doesn't get into our industry because you also have underground growers, right. Who are very fractured, very like, we're not good at sharing information. Right. And I come from an open source background and the reason why I, yeah, I give away a lot, right? It's just like, it's just like, it's in my nature, right? It's like, it's, if I, if I have the choice of giving you a whole bunch of information for free, I'd rather do that than charge you for it. Sorry, just me. Um, but um, it's like, we're not good at communicating. And so underground growers are done this disservice because also our mycologists, the people who are most akin to us um, during uh, the 60s and 70s, because of the war on drugs and, you know, everything all to fall out, like they were forced into the shadows. They were forced into laboratories, right? They were forced into restrictive government contracts and things like that and gag orders, right? So you've got your lab mycos worried about yeast, bread molds, you know, stuff like that. More and more mushroom cultivation is there now. Don't get me wrong. Over the last couple of decades, it's exploded, but no one knows about it, right? right? Because it's not like we have conferences where we all stand up and talk about science, right? Or give research papers or have meetups and shit like that. Um, and then you also have commercial mushroom farmers, right? And commercial mushroom farmers very normally think about this like any other American, US, or overseas crop, right? They're not necessarily pushing the boundaries of science. Like you've got people like us, you've got Mossy Creek, you've got Southwest, you've got Myers, you've got ER. A lot of these people have like made individual steps. Uh, William P. D. Brown, like they they made these huge impacts in kind of like their spaces, right? But it's like it doesn't get out, it doesn't get more widespread, and so 
you've got to kind of merge everything together, right? And so soil science, like substrate. What I realized is like soil science is fungal science, right? It's like if you take a step back, fungi love growing in soil, right? It is their natural habitat. Though they fruit from trees, when they exist inside of a tree, like when a reishi is inside of a living tree, it is in homeostasis. It does not take over. It is not in competition with the tree. It's kind of sitting dormant and it feels like your molecules. And then when the tree gets injured, so the inner surface of the fungi is exposed to air, then it will fruit. Then it will start getting kind of pushy. Now it's like, hey, I need a spore bow, bro, like tree, give me more seeds, right? Um, or when the tree dies, that's when the fungus. But where did those fungi come from? How did they get to the tree? It's not immaculate conception, right? It came from the soil, right? It's like fungi and um, moss and algae are the reason why we have oxygen. The reason why we can even exist as human beings, right? And so if you, if you look at most of our substrate blends, most of them fly in the face of the first substrate, the first soil blend, a uh, beginner cannabis person will make, right? If you've ever heard of a living soil, there's a reason why living soils work so well because they've got everything that plants and fungi crave, right? And in fact, a lot of people will add endo and ectomycorrhizal. So when I was starting out, I was trying to scale things, but I said, wait a minute, you're saying cocoa core, vermiculite, okay, so I use perlite for my my cannabis plants and for my garden outside, but okay, vermiculite, that's fine. It works the same way, different mineral, whatever. Um, and then you're like, oh, okay, so then you can add some gypsum. Okay, that's a, that's, that's a buffer that'll aerate it, right? Mm -hmm. Add little oxygen pockets and trace minerals. Like, okay, but this is beginning to look a lot like a, like a soil blend. Like, and then it stops, right? It's like cocoa, verb, gypsum. And I'm like, where's everything? <laughs> right? It's like, so um, let me ruin something else. Coco Quar is nutrition. Anybody who tells you that it's the perfect casing layer is wrong because Coco Quar is made up of lignin, hemicellulose, cellulose. That is the same stuff that straw in different amounts is made of, mm -hmm. free pulp and soda. Coco Quar is very bioavailable to a fungus. So is vermiculite. Because vermiculite is just a mineral that just happens to get in the way of the fucking fungus. Because the fungus, again, operates through exoenzymes. So it's spraying acids all over the place and shattering the molecular bonds, right? It wants a carbon molecule, it wants a nitrogen molecule, and a phosphorus molecule. It doesn't want anything else. It's not going to absorb that through its cell walls, right? So um, it's spraying that all over the place. And so... If you look at soil science, right, um, there's a great book called The New Soil 2.0 or The Ideal Soil 2.0. I'm forgetting the actual name it's at work. Um, and he points out things like soil is 50 to 80% mineral by volume. And so when you're trying to grow anything out in your garden, you're adding things like worm castings. Why? Worm castings add nitrogens and um, other amino acids and minerals and compounds that actually help bring bacteria, good bacteria, aerobic bacteria, in other words, bacteria that breathes with oxygen, who fungi evolved with. Like, fungi and bacteria can't live without one another. It's just sort of like one of those things where bacteria is what fungi evolved from, right, through a very complex series of evolutionary hops. Um, right? So it's like they evolved together. They, it's like there are parts of soils and substrates that fungi can't necessarily unlock easily. And so they have to slow down, right? It's like, oh shit, somebody put me on charcoal. This is going to take a bit, right? And so I'm going to have to expend a shit ton of energy, nitrogen and sugars, trying to figure out and get my enzymes to like dissolve stuff, right? Um, and so 
it's like you've got your cocoa mix, but where's the fuel? Like you've got cocoa, berm, and gypsum. Where's the nitrogen? Like there's going to be some in the cocoa, and there's going to be some in your grain spawn. There's going to be tons in your grain spawn. Like that's why we use it, right? It's so high in nitrogen that it's like it's a great thing for starting life. Any type of life. <laughs> Usually, you know, if you don't sterilize it right, the bad stuff. Um, but um a uh, typical cocoa berm gypsum mix, it's like, okay, it's got trace minerals, but there's not enough fuel to get an optimal crop, right? The reason why is the same reason why a cannabis plant or anything else would not thrive on that. There's no nutrition. There's no minerals, right? So how do we get it closer to a regular substrate? Well, when I was beginning, I was like, well, fuck it. I'll just go down to the grocery store. You know what I did? There's this um, cannabis substrate called Frog Farm. And they've got this like ocean blend and it's got all sorts of good stuff. It's got like it's peat moss and worm castings, newer compost, this and that. <laughs> I took that, I put it into unicorn bags and I sterilized it. And then I used that as my bulk substrate. Why? Because they fucking loved it. Because fungi, like plants and other things growing out in nature, they love that nutrition. They love that blend. That's how they, like, that's what they look for. Right, that's adaptive evolution at play, right? They're looking for that complexity. They get bored. They are alive, right? When you're feeding them the same thing over and over, or there's no there's no broad spectrum, you know, um, minerals or nutrition, et cetera, they're not gonna be at their optimal state. They'll fruit. Like this is why you can grow oysters on like fucking oil, okay? It's like, don't get me wrong, fungi will basically fruit it's like they fruit on my LP. Like half my LC jars have fruit in the top because why not? Um, they fruit on they my morels fruit on my auger plates and then my LC jars, right? It's like given enough time and good enough conditions, fungi who generate mushrooms will go out of their effing way to make mushrooms, right? That's their genetic imperative, right? And so it's like okay, so. If we want to make a fungus blend, like for your substrate, how do we make it like really good for a fungus? Well, we just take a book from growing vegetables. You know, what does, when you go and buy substrate or you go and buy soil for your, um, and that actually threw me off as a beginner because I'm in here, I'm like, what the fuck is a substrate? Like, do you mean soil? Are you, are you telling me to put soil? It, are you telling me to put soil in the tub? Right, like, right. Um, so what we, but I ended up doing is figuring out. It's like, yeah, it's like not only do you want more of a blend that's more in tune with soil science, right? So, fifty to eighty percent mineral by volume. That means adding things like gypsum and lime and azomite and oyster shells, any sorts of like calcium and minerals. Why? Because fungi basically evolved eating that stuff and absorbing it than giving us oxygen, right? I mean, ultimately resulting in like the systems that allow us to breathe, right? They want that stuff. Now, come to find out, why do they love manures, right? They love worm castings. They love bat guano, love turtle guano. They love horse guano. They love, the, they love all the poops, right? They'll basically any, right? It's because it's partially composted matter that is rich in aerobic bacteria once it's excreted. So when you take a bacteria and you close off its oxygen, it becomes anaerobic, right? Non-oxygen breathing. Anaerobic bacteria, anaerobic bacteria cannot exist at the same time. They are mutually like exclusive, right? So when you think about contamination that's going bacterial and things like that, it's because you cut off oxygen, right? How does it do that? You cover up the filter patch, tighten things up. You don't give it enough fresh air, right? And so it goes anaerobic. It kills off all the oxygenated stuff, right? So when you take post animal manure, right, it's sitting, it's sitting inside of the cow's stomach or the bull stomach or whatever poop you're using today, like the worm stomach, but that's not how that, anyways. Um, what is in baby stomach? Um, but uh, when you take that and you put it out of a horse, right? Number one, the spores that it ate off the forest floor and everything survived it, right? Because they're made out of freaking chitin and they're inert, right? So they're basically in suspended animation the entire time they're inside of the animal. 
Number two, when that poop hits the ground, like that, um, God, what was that song by that rock band? Yeah, when the poop hits the ground, um, uh, what happens is that it's exposed to oxygen. What happens to the bacterial population then? All of the bad bacteria, the anaerobic bacteria that's living inside your digestive tract and everything else like that, just hi, sayonara. Um, and then the aerobic bacteria move in, and now that you're exposed to oxygen, those mushroom spores can now germinate. Exam. Also, uh, hooked animal manure is the only place that you're going to find things like copper, copper cobalt, and other transition elements which fungi are attracted to, right? So how do you get around all of this, right? How do you make a good substrate blend? You use something more in tune with nature, right? And so this doesn't go for hardwood blends necessarily because hardwood blends are a special case because in that case, you're actually trying to trigger a fruit body that is akin to a tree with a fungus living in homeostasis, right? That is a different thing. but. If you're working on therapeutics, cubes, um, secondary composters, which cubes, most cubes are not. Um, if you're working on these guys, it's like they're not going to love as much lignin necessarily as, say, an oyster mushroom or a primary decomposer like a shiitake, right? So shiitake love, like, if you give them, like, 80% hardwood and, like, 20% nitrogen, they're happy as plants. You try to do that with, you know, a cubensis, it's not going to be happy. It will grow. It will fruit. Why? You've, can, you've fulfilled the basic molecular needs of a fungus, right, in adaptive evolution, right? It would be stupid if it couldn't fruit replicate itself given suboptimal conditions, say, the reactors of Chernobyl, um, right? It's like you'd be a shitty, like, decomposer if you died all the time. Right. Um, so, um, so if you take a cubensis mushroom and you put it in a thing of master mix, master's mix, it will colonize. It will be slow. It'll be weird. It may not work, but it will also fruit when it fully uh, colonizes. Um, and um, it will fruit given enough time. It's like most mushrooms, even like the most really annoying ones like chicken or beefsteak or even morels, like, give them enough time, they will fruit, right? Anyway, substrates, right? We get into a soil blend. So take your cocoa and berm and you add some worm castings, right? Then you go and get some composted manure and you throw it in there. Now, here's the catch. Um, when you go and buy substrate or soil from the store, is it pasteurized or sterilized? I Three, no two, idea. one, sterilized. Sterilized? Why? I guess. Yeah. It's always sterilized. Why? Because pasteurized is alive. The shelf life is low. Mm -hmm. Contamination risk is high. Um, you're got, it's going to mold like you can't ship it anywhere. Also, here's the thing. And if you go and read laboratory science, you go read everything. What we are doing is a race, right? Where we are introducing a fungus and we're trying to get it to grow outgrow anything else that could possibly hit that environment, right? And so, like, fungi have the same problem as cannabis plants, right? If you take a cannabis plant and you put the seed in there and then you just insert a bunch of bacterial competitors or a bunch of fungi or something else like that, it ain't going to grow, mm -hmm. right? You may think that, oh, but symbiosis, et cetera, it's like, no, it's, a, it's an ecosystem. Worse. It's a constrained ecosystem. And like all ecosystems, even though it's symbiotic and mutualistic, there's finite resources. So the more competition you have and the faster it grows, the worse the thing you want to grow will grow. So gardeners learned this millions of years ago. That's why it's like, that's why you have hot compost, right? You want to sterilize to kill all the seeds, all the endospores and things like that, right? Now. Why do, why do we sterilize everything? Why do we sterilize our therapeutic substrates, our manure substrates, et cetera? Because you get better yield, you get faster colonization, you get more disease resistance. Why? Go and search for um, filamentous fungi sterilization, pasteurization, 
or search for oyster mushroom sterilization versus pasteurization. Uh, at least in Google Scholar, that will pull up several studies using a variety of different mushrooms. So a wide range of primary decomposers, uh, secondary decomposers, um, ones that like bacterial pairs, ones that don't. What they found every single time, at least on the mushrooms that they were trying to grow as a crop, um, this applies to cubensis too, um, if you sterilize it, there is less competition. Less competition is better given finite resources. Right. Right. So when you introduce competition at the wrong point in time, you will kill the thing you wanted to cultivate. Right. Yeah, and John so, talked about that a little bit. The idea that yep. it, he used the metaphor, he said, you know, you want to start with a blank canvas, especially if you're going to introduce my product. I don't, I don't want to have my product immediately competing w w with yeah. uh, rogue players, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we make grain spawn, right? Because if you take liquid culture and you just spray it all over some uh, dirt outside, it will grow. It's going to take a lot of time and it's got to do a lot of work. It's going to fail. It's going to fall back. It's like, it's going to fight, right? Think about this. Like oh, yeah. if you have a pizza in front of you, right? That pizza is your substrate, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you have you and the friend next to you who eats most of the pizza every time, you can either have them sitting next to you eating that pizza, or you could eat that entire pizza. It's your choice, but you know what you're going to get more pizza with? Right. Right? Yeah. So We're gardeners knew this. For the same resources. Yeah. So, so yeah. that's why when you use it for cannabis, what you do is you introduce non-competitive ones like endo and ectomycorrhizals, but you rarely introduce like primary or even secondary decomposers to that blend until the plant is more mature because then the plant has the maturity to withstand that competition. So what you do is you sterilize the substrate. So how do you process manure? Uh, so say you got some poop. Uh, let's say it's dried, let's say it's not even perfectly composted. Break it up, shatter it. Like get it as finely as you can, put it in a damn blender, put it in a pillow, smash it up, et cetera. Blend it in your cocoa blend and sterilize the entire thing. You're done. Right. No special composting, no anything else like that. If you can get composted manure from your local farm, go get it. If you can just get great big cow patties from the field, go mix it up with your cocoa, berm, gypsum, lime, azomite, et cetera. Done. Doesn't matter why. The problem that we have as humans, and I'm going to have to go so Jesus is late. Um, the problem we have as humans is that um, we project our egos onto fungi, right? And we also project our physiology. Fungi don't eat like us, right? They absorb things through their cell walls. That means that they are operating at the molecular level. They are breaking apart the matter into the smallest molecular form possible. And they do it intentionally, right? They're not just doing this randomly. They are looking for specific molecules and excreting certain enzymes to get those molecules using a lock and key enzyme method, right? And um, but uh, they are doing this very intentionally. And so, again, because it's molecular, you can sterilize it all day long. They don't give a shit. Right. Because what they do is they take it and they excrete their um, enzymes. Those amino, uh, those acids uh, interact with the environment and they create secondary things. They also generate amino acids and other things inside of their metabolites. Their metabolites help kick off the growth of the aerobic bacteria that they naturally pair with in their environment, right? That's why, that's why you can have a sterilized grain jar with a fungus growing in it, and it can just go anaerobic, right? The bacteria have to come from someplace, right? It's not, again, it's not immaculate conception. It's not like the bacteria flew in your sealed grain jar and like made it go anaerobic, you cut off the air. The bacteria was always there. It's just the population thing. Right, okay. Right, you have all the building blocks of life. And so fungi don't care, but they do like helpers, right? They love their fungi pairs, right? And so that's why something like Dr. Mike's MGT is perfect, right? Because when you add it in at the right moment, when you're putting it in substrate and things like that, as you're putting that, you're taking a mature fungi that can withstand interacting in that community. But you're not adding in things that compete with those fungi. If you go and look at the research papers, 
for bacterial pairing and culinary mushrooms, Klingeringae, Pleurus osteotis, right? And those are the search terms that'll pull it up, right? What they found is like uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria, phosphorus fixing bacteria, um, Bacillus SPP, um, things like that. When they're introduced at the substrate phase, they and the fungi operate in tandem, right? The fungi will farm them, they will kill them off and eat their molecules. They will also absorb the phosphorus released by them. They will work in tandem with them. But you don't introduce it at the grain stage. Why? Because when you take a liquid culture and you put it on grain, the fungus ain't ready for that. Like, okay, I guarantee you the bacteria grows faster than the fungus. In a hundred times, it will always grow faster, right? And that's why you have to use so little. That's why when you're doing this with cannabis plants and vegetable gardens, you're using like a gram and a gallon in most cases for like these mycorrhizal additives, right? Because you need so little for that life to take hold that, yeah, it's like you don't want to add a lot, especially that bacterial additive because bacteria grow like fucking weeds. Endo and ectomycorrhizae do too, right? Because they don't have secondary purposes like fruiting, right? Endo and ectos are just like, well, Right. You get a molecule, you get a molecule, you'll get a molecule, I get a molecule, everybody gets a molecule. Gotcha. Yeah, right. sorry, well, I, we're I, we're talked, we're I talked, I talked the entire we're time. Close to the two hour point. Um, Dick Butt wanted to know, um, where is it here? Um, he wanted to know a bunch. In, in hindsight, where he's there, a friend uh, of mine. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, he wanted to know if there are things you would change and then how you view like your, your next five years, basically. Um, I really want to get to a point where I can actually start to slow down. Um, because I want to do more work on the book. I want to be able to go into the forest and do more conservation work. There's some um, particular you know, species and things I want to go and try to like grow in the wild. But then also I want to do a lot more phenotype PCR work. I want to do DNA sequencing, things like that. But unfortunately, uh, it's like five years from now. Unfortunately, it's like, I feel like I'm going to be fucking processing grain until the day I die most days. Um, it really is just like one of those things where you get into this and you think that maybe you're going to make a bunch of easy money and you realize it's grind. It is, right. Yeah. And you got to love it. Right, because if you don't love it, it's going to be like, oh, this sucks. Ass. Right, right. Um, so in five years, in a perfect world, we'd be up humming along. I'd have, you know, we'd have a thriving decriminalized market uh, across both the U.S. We'd be able to very talk openly about our research, uh, about the research of others, trials, control testing, fruiting methods, systems, apparatuses. We'd be able to very publicly talk about, you know. At scale fruiting for just about any species. I mean, I want to get morels fruiting regularly. It's like they're still sort of like touch and go, not consistent. I need to get these. I need to fuck around more, but I don't know if it's time, right? But I want to finish the book, and I want to get out there, and I just really want to show more and more people, like, not only are these things mushrooms that taste good and look cool and, you know, maybe help you therapeutically and things like that, but um, without them, we can't exist. Right, it's that binary, right? I don't think people truly appreciate that. It's like if I were to Thanos, all the fungi, we're done. organic life on Earth would halt. Yeah, just bees can break. Yeah, right? man, it's like lately the bees get all the credit. You know, the bees are so important, but ah, ah, ah. But remember, very important. It, it's the criminal part of humans is that we think we're all important when you're like, okay, so the bees form a fungus that fun or actually fungi affect bees to spread their spores on the pollen. And then the bees actually farm their own type of fungi. And then they also got their bacterial pairs that they grow in populations. And then termites actually cultivate mushrooms and fungi and bacteria. And it's like, what you realize is like, you can't, it's like fungi, they're possibly the key to climate change, right? They're the key to many uh, possible illnesses and things like that, but we're not, our society isn't set up or incentivized for bank loans or, you know, investors for something to go and try to figure out, you know, how to sequester 
you know, carbon in the forest or figure out how to cultivate these at scale or make these easy. Because every time you're growing mushrooms in the house, you're technically sequestering carbon, right? You're actually helping the environment. And you take that, you throw it outside, it's helping the environment, right? It's all it's fucking amazing when you get down to it and you're looking at it at the molecular level. It's like, holy shit, right? It's like, I am, I am holding... I'm holding millions of years of highly trained adaptive evolution in my hands. And these things are designed for one purpose. And that's to like break carbon down and return this energy that's trapped back into the environment. And without them, Earth couldn't sustain life. Right. And it's like, I want more people just growing oyster mushrooms or, you know, I want people getting therapeutics and growing them well and consistently. I don't want legalization to be a bunch of like fucking hydroponic biochem people forcing crazy ass regulations because they don't understand that it's like the reason why you can eat mushrooms that are grown on trash is because fungi don't allow contaminations or pathogens through the cell wall. Also, good luck on stuff like E. coli surviving the enzyme reaction, right? Again, we're talking about the strongest acids that we know of on earth. That's why we use them in industrial cleaners. No, but anyways, it's like, we're not, we're not, we're not set up as a society for that. So in five years, I'd like to have a company that I can hire, um, you know, the right people who are really just passionate about, fungi and where we can see this species and really just really kind of go into just this unknown area of like where can we go with this like what can we do with them like how can we restore forests how can we you know from a therapeutic standpoint what are what are the gene lines like what is all this bullshit about mutant crosses and everything else like that it's like give me a pcr machine a dna sequencer like you're gonna ruin everyone's life. I'm like, no, all those varieties are like fucking golden pizza. Like, nope. Right? Right. It's like, for example, fungi don't do sideways straight passing. So your little mycelium must mm -hmm. You're not getting hybridization. Right. Um, yeah, we can go on for hours, but it's like, it's an amazing thing. And I just want to be able to set up in a humble and the mushroom champ as we move forward as uh, to be a position of good, like just kind of being like, here's the science, here's how to make it easy, how to tear away the complexity, but more power, more importantly, it's like, how do we, how do we really pair with these? Do what I think that they're capable of for humanity, right? It's like, uh, we talk about things that co-evolved with humans, like chickens, dogs, and cannabis. It's like, we co-evolved with fungi, like there's something special there and that's powerful, right? And that's, a tool and a partner that we could be working with for a lot more good. Um, love all that. That was very well stated. Totally agree. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, it is getting late. Um, if uh, people want to stick around, you guys are welcome to stick around. I got to do a couple things uh, upstairs here before I go to bed. Um, again, Jesse, thank you so much. You, uh, you're just. Uh, I really, uh, you're a small handful of people that that are in my. I gotta, I gotta keep talking to these guys and listening to what they're saying because they're always bringing out new interests in mycology for me, giving me stuff to read, stuff to think about, and uh, I, I, I just fell in love with your whole vibe on YouTube. I think what do you got? Like almost a hundred videos on YouTube at this point. Uh, like, it's like I, I trim it back. I need to do more. It's like it came from the tech world, and also one of the reasons why it's like I was promoted to like VP class at one point, but very quickly demoted because it's like it's like you, what you see is what you get. Like what you see on YouTube, what you see here is like that's me. Like there's no other me. Great. Like I, I am fucking lazy, and I have no memory recall for like day to day things. So I'm like, people are like, oh man, you're totally cheating. You got like. Fifteen girlfriends, and, I, and I'm like, how could you fucking do that? Like, that's that's so tiring. Like, yeah. nah, yeah, no. What you see is what you get. And so when I'm publicly speaking, it's it, yeah, it would piss executives off all the time. They're like, you're not allowed to talk to us that way. I'm like, fuck, I ain't. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't care how much you pay me. You're still an idiot. 
Hey, sorry. Yeah, corporate America, they love that, though. Yeah, honesty, they love that. No, anyway, no, well, no. thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, you know, the, we're all excited to see the final product of the book. I've gotten to read some of it. Uh, the rough draft, it, it's wonderful. There's a lot of really great, compelling things in there. Um, and uh, mostly, if foundationally to me, you're a reputable vendor coming at it for all the right reasons. Hey, and but uh, to, to full disclosure, I have fucked up. It's been three years. Of course, I have everybody, fucked things yeah, up. I have yeah. shipped. I have been slow to ship. I have fucked things up. I have overpromised and underdelivered because I'm always that optimist. It's like, no, if I just push myself sure. harder, like I can do the thing that I promised them to do. And it's like, we all learn. Like my only thing you is like, if I fuck up, good. right? It's like, if I fuck up, I better learn from it. I better not be making the same fuck up every day because otherwise it's just crazy. Yeah. Right. Yep. Anyway, we love you. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, I am. I'm gonna cash out here and uh, totally understand. You're probably pretty spent yourself. I'm sure you've done more mycology today than many of us have. So, um, thank you very much. Yeah, hopefully tomorrow I can work on the book. I'm finishing a prologue on how life actually came to exist through a clever set of chemistry problems. Awesome. Very cool. All right, because guys, obviously, well, it's a book on mycology. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Jesse. Get... Appreciate it. Evolutionary biology. Evolutionary biology. <laughs> All right. Guys, have a good Steve, night. Thanks, Jesse's everyone. Jesse's going to teach us dance moves next time. I need, I need to... No, no, no. That's my pocket. So it's like what I figured out. It's like all my yeast uh, on my auger and like liquid culture things. I decided I'm going to have yeast extract in my pocket. And whenever somebody's like, how do I get more vigorous growth? I'm like, pocket yeast. <laughs> Pocket pep um, tone too. I realized that yeast yeast powder is both ultra fine and smells bad. Yeah. So anyway, pocket yeast. Cool man. All right. Good night, everyone. Moving on pocket yeast. <laughs> <laughs> I would expect nothing less. All right, man. Take care, bro. Right. Going I'm out of here. Later. You guys are welcome to chat a little bit afterwards, but but I'm, I'm heading out for a minute. All right. Night. All right. Take care. Thanks again.